Okay, let's start. Good morning, afternoon, and evening. Hola, hello, bonjour, hola. Niao, konnichiwa, annyeonghaseyo. And hello all. And welcome and thank you, Simbis people, for joining us the 104th seminar, and I call it Harvard University Day. Last week, there was no Simbis seminar due to the annual AICHE meeting. I had a great time meeting many people, including Simbis speakers and audience. We'll have another break next week due to the United States Thanksgiving holiday. Okay, it is my tremendous honor to introduce very briefly our pioneer speaker, Professor Johan Parson. He is a professor at Harvard University. He is a Swedish mathematician and systems biologist whom I got to hear about almost 20 years ago due to his paper, summing up the noise in gene networks. That is one of the most difficult papers I have ever read, uh, but laid the foundation for the noise in the gene network. Recently, he started to lead a huge team with the more than 100 million pro dollar project uh, supported by RPIH to deal with antibiotic resistant issues, the, one of the most important issues in the world. Johan, thanks for, thanks for your pioneering and innovative contribution to the field and the virtual podium is all yours now. Thank you again. All right, yeah, thank you so much uh, for inviting me and for that introduction. Um, I guess it was a hard paper read. I didn't have a single figure in that paper, actually, uh, which was retrospect, not the way to do it. Um, all right. So um, that kind of um, covers my first slide a little bit, uh, namely to say that um, is this responding. Let's see. Yeah. All right. Uh, all right. So historically, I started out in uh, applied math, stochastic processes. Um, uh, my PhD devices were from theoretical physics. My first faculty position was in applied math and theoretical physics. And what we focused on was heterogeneity in single cells, uh, namely the fact that uh, in the cell, many of the reactants like the proteins and the mRNAs are present in low numbers. And even if one component of your network is in low numbers, that can uh, create spontaneous randomness that then spreads like uh, essentially ripples out in the networks and randomizes the whole behavior. Um, so we use essentially continuous time marker processes to describe that. And in the beginning, it was essentially toy models, like simple systems. Um, and then I got increasingly concerned that uh, we are kind of oversimplifying things. Um, but I guess as opposed to most people to, who then move into like large scale simulations, I was also very concerned that uh, if you make a larger simulation, you put in details that aren't, aren't real. Um, so this seems like an, an, an intractable problem. You can't do anything about it. Uh, but it turns out that if you're willing to sacrifice uh, uh, something and say, we will no longer describe what the system is doing, we will satisfy ourselves with finding out the few things that the system is absolutely not doing. Uh, so that are there certain things that are made impossible by the few things specified, regardless of an infinite number of things that are unspecified? And one analogy for this is you try to heat the, uh, your room, you try to control the temperature, it's, let's say uh, 20 Celsius. If you have an error in your thermometer and you, you can't measure the temperature perfectly, it doesn't matter what you do to the heaters and coolers and fans and everything else, you cannot maintain a perfect temperature because you have lost the information about the temperature in, in, a, in a Shannon sense right? due to the probabilistic nature of, of one of the steps. And that's what happens in cells is that if one single step is probabilistic, you cannot have uh, reliable uh, communication. You've lost information in some sense. And that kind of information cannot be uh, regained by any processing. So you're just sort of stuck with that. So then we decided to take that path for almost 20 years to say, uh, let's specify a few things about a system. Other things are unspecified. And let's try to find things that are impossible. Like, so here's a, a simple, uh, very simple example of this. You have four reactions. You're making two molecules. They are controlling each other's production rates. Uh, and there's uh, the only Swedish mathematician I, I know pretty much essentially proved that 
these kinds of systems in the deterministic world cannot oscillate indefinitely. They can't give uh, limit cycles, something called the, the Bendixson negative criterion. It turns out as soon as you open up for fluctuations, you can have uh, sustained fluctuations and fairly beautiful oscillations for a very long time period. Uh, but it turns out that other things are impossible. So the variance divided by the average in each component, for example, cannot be below the Poisson limit in both. You cannot uh, have a system like this where the two components both uh, are narrowly uh, more narrowly distributed than a Poisson distribution. So that's one super simple example, but this is something that a game that we played uh, with several people in the lab for, for 20 years and just try to figure out, uh, can we say that this is impossible, this is possible, this is impossible, and then somehow narrow uh, down uh, the, the world of, of, of possibilities. Um, and so far we've been uh, lucky in the sense that once we prove a theorem, we've been lucky in the sense that they have been very restrictive, but we've been unlucky in the sense that we've often had to spend years on new mathematical methods for each problem, and we haven't had so much reuse of each method. So it's been a, a very long, uh, painful process. We still work on it, but uh, the main thrust of my lab right now is, is all uh, experiments. And it's, essentially it's uh, single cell microscopy, microfluidics, and especially this kind of mother machine that uh, I think many have seen at this point uh, that uh, Sakyo Nyon uh, developed, uh, where essentially the cells are sitting in dead end trenches. And as one cell grows and divides, it pushes out the others. And then once you fill up the trench, any surplus cells are just washed away. Um, and about 15 years ago, we started working uh, on this in the context of bacillus subtilis and cell fate decisions, where the cells are making sort of uh, a fairly stable decision to enter one state and then another state, and they can sit there for many generations. So here's a, a typical, uh, what's called chymograph. It's the same trench at different time points. And if you quantify the signal, uh, you can look at this for uh, different proteins. Here's a GP and an RFP. Um, and this is not seconds or minutes, these are cell generations. So we can actually look at uh, hundreds, even thousands in principle uh, of cell generations and look at these very slow epigenetic uh, dynamical behaviors. Um, and this was a, a big effort in the lab for a long time to figure out um, what explains this underlying behavior. Uh, typically when you see two stable states, you uh, expect bistability, but it turns out that bistability uh, typically generates what's called pseudo exponential escape rates meaning that the time interval spent in each state, state, state tends to be uh, exponentially distributed. And in this case, the, the long duration state, the green one here, uh, is a perfect exponential. But the red one is extremely non-exponential. It's very typical, uh, uh, very stereotyped, um, uh, very narrow. Uh, so we spent uh, many, many years trying to figure out the exact underlying chemistry and genetic network uh, for this. So it's a natural system, but we, we did a lot of things that people do in synthetic biology. Um, once we figured out the, the network, we uh, rebuilt everything synthetically and made sure that a synthetic system built the way we think this works uh, indeed re uh, repeats this behavior. So it was kind of a first brush with synthetic biology. But then pretty quickly, we moved on to so real synthetic biology, I guess you should call it. Um, and we started working on the uh, repressor later that uh, Mike Elowitz and Stan Leibler um, essentially um, uh, together with the toggle switch from the Collins lab kind of uh, launched synthetic biology as, as a field. Uh, and I always love these two systems because they're super simple, but they're still far from trivial. Uh, the repressor later, just to remind everybody, uh, it's three repressors connected in a ring, a uh, repressor one, repressors number two, repressors number three, repressors number one. So if number one goes up, number uh, two starts going down, and then number three will start going up and that pushes down the first one. Right? So, so if you go up, you have a chain of events that will essentially push you down a bit later. And that gives you potentially these uh, stable oscillations. So you have these three repressors. Uh, it was built in a way that the second plasmid encoded the uh, fluorescent reporter. Uh, and then they observed the reporters. Um, and they were very honest in the paper saying that uh, things were super noisy. Uh, I think only uh, what they claimed the paper was that 40% of the cells showed some sign of oscillation and 60% did not. Uh, which I think it was, it's always refreshing when people um, uh, point out when they some, something, something doesn't work, because that's obviously a, uh, an important part of the system. Uh, and then people are, uh, speculated after saying, okay, maybe it was too simple. Uh, real oscillators in nature are much more complicated. Uh, my perspective is always that the, the simplest things are the best, because every time that you add more steps, you also have more opportunity for randomization and information loss. 
So certainly it can help to have more components, but it can also have the opposite effect. So we asked the question, this is uh, Laurent uh, uh, Puffin and uh, Trottier, who has their own lab up in, uh, uh, in Canada. Uh, why didn't this work any better? And the first thing we uh, uh, did was to recode it to say, let's have two different reporters. Let's put one reporter uh, on the separate plasmid as before. Now we didn't make that one red. And then we put a reporter on the same plasmid just to see if it's the reporter plasmid that, that, that creates any issues. Uh, and we did indeed see that the reporter plasmid fluctuates quite a bit. And that sort of destroys the apparent fluctuations. Right? But then we also found something much more striking, which was that uh, every now and then, every 10,000 generations or so, the cell would entirely lose the plasmid. And when you look at those cells that just lost the reporter plasmid, right, it's just the reporter. It should not have any effect on, there's no arrows going back here on the system. It's just the X is repressing YFP. There's no arrow going back. But when you look at the, uh, the YFP, it turns out there's fairly noisy oscillations. And as soon as the reporter plasmid is lost, suddenly the period changes, the uh, periodicity changes and becomes this beautiful oscillator. Um, uh, not a perfect oscillator, but still a good oscillator. And it turned out what happened here is that the uh, the reporter competed for protease. Uh, actually, it was actually not even a competitor. It was an anti-competitor for, for, uh, for proteolysis. Um, uh, it's easy to imagine that if you have a degradation tag on your fluorescent protein, it will compete for protease with your actual repressors that have similar attacks. Um, and the weird thing here is that we observed uh, a very strong interaction, but in the opposite direction of, of what we expected. Um, right, so we spent a long time, uh, I can't go into the details here, but we did a lot of the, the stochastic theory and we decided that the, the main issue here is really that each repressor decays exponentially and towards the end of that exponential, you have very low numbers. And that process randomizes everything. So we said, if you have exponential decay, but at some point you switch over to linear decay, you can eliminate that, that asymptotic approach. And one way to do that is just to provide uh, titration sites. Uh, so you make uh, DNA binding sites, or you make uh, uh, actual repressors that are just sort of dead end repressors, and they just um, uh, soak up one of the repressors. This kind of counterintuitive from a, a verbal perspective, maybe uh, the repressor later has to have an odd number uh, of repressors that control each other. Now we're adding a fourth repressor uh, that does nothing but just uh, destroy one of the repressors. Uh, and that's something that the, the theory said, this is the optimal way, way of doing it and it can give you much better oscillations. And that's exactly what we found. We, we, we built these oscillators that could generate for uh, 500 generations with, without drifting much uh, in terms of uh, of haze. Uh, and also super robust. It doesn't matter what growth conditions, they can be colonies with uh, Pam Silver and others and, and David Riggler. Uh, we put them in mice and you can actually even count the generations in the gut of the mouse with these things. Uh, all right, so that's kind of uh, what we've done on the, on the synthetic biology side. I'm just gonna flip through a few slides of what we've been up to the last couple of years, which is more method development. Uh, we've put a lot of effort into microfluidics, into optics and so forth. Uh, I already showed you some of these things before. We've expanded this to, I think, 150 different organisms. We've done, I don't know, 20 different human cell types, lots of yeast, uh, 150 different bacteria. Uh, and, uh, and, and we can do this in fairly high throughput now. We started off with maybe 100, uh, then we went to 1,000, 10,000, and so forth. I think the says a million here. I think the latest one we have is two and a half million, which means two and a half different uh, million uh, lineages, uh, each containing a, a separate cell grown and dividing. And we can track the gene expression. So here's one of those repressulators, for example, in there. Um, uh, that kind of throughput is hard to relate to, but maybe it's easier to see one of these movies. So this is where we were maybe like 10 years ago. This is maybe five years ago. Uh, and uh, let's see here. Uh, this is where we are now, essentially, where we can look at roughly 10 million cells in a given time, 1 billion divisions. But, uh, we're hoping to get another factor 10 or 100 uh, out of this eventually. Uh, but that kind of throughput uh, really matters the most when you can start addressing the individual uh, positions. So one thing we did is develop things where we go in with the optical tweezers and we just physically grab the cell and just pull it out. Uh, so you can you can flush things out. So here. Uh, it turned out like instead of being uh, clever mathematically and trying to build a new synthetic circuit uh, by building something with mathematical design, we just said, let's build uh, 20,000 repressor or whatever, uh, uh, put them in, try them out, 
And then we just pull out uh, the repressor letters that are the best. And then in a couple of days, we found repressor letters that were just fantastic on all different types of time scales without all the, I mean, there's some thinking mathematically involved behind uh, how we made the mut mutants, but also very, we try to cast a very uh, wide net. Uh, so I thought this was going to be like the big method for my lab going forward. And I think it's it's going to be a big method for us. But uh, it would also be better if we can not just look at the winners, uh, but look at everybody. Uh, so now what we'd like to do is to go in and in situ sequence every single um, every single strain under the microscope in the same trenches at the end of the experiment. And this is something that uh, UN Elf developed in a method called dumpling, but it had fairly low throughput in the, in the first versions. And we've been pushing that throughput. I think they had something like four strains or 20 strains or something. Um, and we want to do this for 100,000 strains and have many copies of each, like 20 copies of each strain, right? So, so that's something we've achieved now. Uh, this is how it looks at the end of the experiment. We, uh, we make a barcode, we see uh, do you have or don't you have a specific component of the barcode? And then we do the same thing in another color, a third color, a fourth color, right? And then every single slide here essentially is a yes or no question. Does a specific lineage uh, uh, have or have not the, the this barcode? And then we run that over the entire, entire thing. Um, so this allows us to look at uh, 100,000 different mutants. We just uh, have a project now, uh, Noah Olsman and, and uh, Jacob Schenker and my lab where they uh, made methods to generate 100,000 different kinds of repressilators and uh, toggle switches and all these dynamic circuits. We put them in, we look at many generations, we get statistics for each one, we get dynamics and everything. And then at the end of the experiment, every single one is genotyped. Um, so that allows us to look at this very, very broad uh, uh, spectrum of behaviors, whether we look at circuits or, or proteins or whatever. Um, and then finally, this is last slide. Um, we have started pushing much more on the microscopy side. So we, we got this very talented uh, optical physicist, uh, Dora Mahechik, who has built uh, uh, live cell super resolution uh, methodologies, uh, things like instant structural nation microscopy, quantitative, uh, quantitative face microscopy and so forth, uh, where we can just get much, much more information. Um, we also do a lot of things like hyperspectral imaging, uh, flim imaging and so forth. Um, and as a part of this grant that uh, uh, Tysark just mentioned, um, we now have a, a huge, huge effort in tens of millions of dollars, essentially, uh, into just the platform where we're essentially going to build uh, cheap um, instruments that can run some of these uh, more advanced imaging modalities and start looking at bacteria more closely, while also running the sort of millions of strains in, in, in parallel. Um, and if anybody is uh, interested in this, we actually have lots of open positions, especially on the uh, optical engineering, microfluidic engineering, but also some genetic engineering and applications in synthetic biology. Um, the grant is more sp specifically towards uh, bacterial infections, but uh, the approach I think can be used for, for many things. And so we're hoping that this is kind of a, a stepping stone for us to start doing synthetic biology much more broadly. Um, all right, I think it might be over time already, so I'll stop there, but uh, thank you. That, that, that is amazing. I, I'm so impressed by the scale of the system and then the throughput you just created. That's fantastic. Thank, Thank you, you so much. I mean, this wonderful one. And I hope, I mean, we, you know, overcome the problem of the antibiotic resistance problem in the near future. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So now the main speaker of today with a longer introduction, Dr. Caitlin Daly completed her doctoral degree at North Dakota State University in December, 2020. We are still you know, under COVID, I guess. While at NDSU, she studied genetic engineering and pharmaceutical sciences. When she became the director of research and scholarly activity at Lucky Vista University, she was awarded a doctoral fellowship and took full ownership of her thesis project using genetic engineering to further oncolytic bacteria towards clinical translation. She then pursued postdoctoral education at the University of Nebraska Medical Center, where she expanded her knowledge of pancreatic cancer biology, immunology, 
and bacterial genetics. Her postdoctoral study at UNMC applied bacterium-based therapeutics to pancreatic cancer module, including developing a high-throughput in vitro model system that imitate blood circulation. She is a co-investigator on several funding awards already and also was promoted to research instructor at UNMC in the fall of 2022. Ultimately, she intends to become an independent career research scientist with an established largely research-focused career at an academic institution and ascribe to the teacher scholar model. And she is right now in job market. So if you, you are the uh, committee member for the hiring a uh, new uh, family member of your university, please consider her seriously. So Caitlin, thank you so much for your time today. Please take it away, it's all yours now. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. This opportunity in this seminar series, um, as Dr. Moon said, I you know, graduated right into the height of the pandemic, so opportunities to share my research and to get critical scientific feedback um, have been somewhat rare. So I'm very excited to be here today um, and to talk to you about some of the work that I did um, through my thesis work um, and into, I was allowed to take that project with me um, when my thesis advisor moved into administration. Um, and I brought it here to work through my postdoc to refine it. Um, and then um, I will continue to move it forward as I move towards independence. Um, so I am working towards changing the pancreatic cancer paradigm um, and really developing Clostridium novi NT um, as an intravenously administered therapeutic. Um, so pancreatic cancer um, is quite a um, dismal diagnosis still, even to this day. Um, unfortunately, this hasn't changed. This diagnosis and prognosis hasn't changed for almost 50 years. Um, our ability to treat this disease um, has not changed with a lot of the major breakthroughs that we've seen in other solid tumors, um, giving a five-year relative survival rate of about 95% uh, percent or higher in other cancers such as prostate or breast um, et cetera. Um, unfortunately, the five-year relative survival rate for pancreatic cancer is 11.5%. Um, this has been raised 1.5% uh, uh, in the last couple of years, um, a total of 3% change in the last 50 years. Um, and this is largely due to the implementation of a combinatorial treatment called Fulfirinox um, that I mentioned now because we'll come back to it in a little bit. Um, but what's really unfortunate is that the median survival from the point of diagnosis is only six months. Um, so this is a really intense diagnosis. It's a very fast cancer, um, and there's not a lot of treatments available. Um, so why is this such a terrible disease? What is, um, I'm sorry, let me move this. Um, why is it so difficult to treat? And one of the reasons, um, at least it's a very complex environment, but at least one of the problems lies within the tumor microenvironment of these solid tumors. Um, this is where the unchecked growth of tumorigenic cells pushes the vasculature that provides oxygen and nutrients further and further away from this core. Um, and that ultimately results in the reduction of oxygen or in the increase in acidity and the increase in necros necrosis at the center of solid tumors, um, as well as altered surface protein expression um, and eventually the suppression of immune response. Um, furthermore, these microenvironmental changes um, are seem to be somewhat ubiquitous, universal. Um, this abnormal blood and lymphatic flow happens in about 95% of solid tumors after surveying the literature. Um, and this is interestingly irrespective of size where we see that hypoxia begins very early in metastatic island development. Um, and to put some numbers in, in a reported median percent PO2 from in situ uh, measurements, um, specifically in pancreatic cancer, a healthy tissue has a percent oxygenation of about 6.8, um, but a tumor will drop to 1.02. Um, and this trend of a pretty significant decrease in oxygenation contends, continues through most solid tumors and even into some of the softer tumors. Um, so 
one of the potential solutions for this uh, has come through synthetic biology and directed evolution um, through the use of microbes. Um, so as Dr. Paulson was talking about infections, um, we're going to shift to uh, not trying to necessarily prevent infections, but what happens if we direct those infections and if we harness those bacteria um, to have really targeted um, infection of, of, say, a solid tumor um, and to mitigate that tumor. Um, using microbes in this manner has a lot of advantages, which you can see on this slide. Um, uh, given that this is a synthetic biology uh, audience, I don't, I'm not going to go into those too much right now. But what I am going to emphasize is that our, our advances in techniques and specifically in genetic modification um, have really moved this field forward over the last five years, where the initial harmful side effects that we were seeing and early research in, in the 60s and 70s um, has really been mitigated by advances in um, our ability to manipulate the genetic environment or the genetic context of these cells. Um, so there are several oncolytic bacterial species that are currently under development um, as tumor therapeutics in various forms of cancer, which you can see on this slide, um, the general um, sort of species that are being um, worked on and developed forward. Several of these species are in in-stage phase, human phase clinical trials. Um, so there's a lot of promise in this field um, and a lot of um, potential. Um, so I'm gonna focus on a Clostridium species today. This is a species that has undergone a uh, significant oncolytic development. There's multiple strains with genomic sequences. Um, but what's really potent about this particular species that I uh, work on, Clostridium novi, is that it's considered gram variable. Um, and this is a little bit of an open question on how this happens um, at a mechanistic level uh, for this bacteria. But when we talk about harnessing it as a therapeutic, um, this provides a really powerful stimulation of the uh, immune system and pancreatic cancer tumors are, are pretty immunologically cold. So if we're both gram positive and gram negative, we can stimulate multiple pathways of immune activation. Um, it is a considered a spore forming bacteria and it does have motility. Um, so all of those culminate in a very, um, a, a great culmination of characteristics to uh, conduct further modification and to really uh, move forward with as a therapeutic. Um, so one of the most important things to emphasize for uh, development as a therapeutic is the Clostridium novi life cycle. Um, I often refer to Clostridium novi NT as C and NT, um, so I might use that shorthand throughout the, the rest of this seminar. Um, so it ha Clostridium novi has a biphasic life cycle um, because it's considered a sporulating bacteria. So the vegetative form cannot survive in virtually any um, oxygenated environment, um, including most physiological conditions, if not all physiological conditions. Um, but in contrast, the spore form can survive in almost any environment, including aerobic environments such as the uh, bloodstream or healthy tumors, um, but in order for germination to occur, we have to be able to return to that anaerobic state um, that is relatively rare um, in the human body. Um, and then I also want to note that we are different than a lot of sort of current therapeutics or canonical um, chemotherapeutics and cancer therapeutics in general, in that we don't have to dose at the uh, therapeutic efficacy dosage, it, or we don't have to dose at we can dose below therapeutic efficacy and still get therapeutic effects um, because Clostridium novi is capable of proliferation. Um, and by getting um, a small amount of these bacteria or their spores to our target location, we can still accomplish tumor mitigation. Um, so the spore form in particular, not only is it able to survive in oxygenated environments, but um, it is considered immunologically inert. Uh, it is cleared through phagocytosis without um, adverse effects, um, which makes it a very potent, um, very uh, smart, if you will, therapeutic where we can dose uh, with the spores and allow for colonization and directed infection of the tumors with the vegetative form. Um, the spore form, it has some very not not canonical spore activities. Um, and this is where it kind of gets into hot water with microbiologists. Um, but there's evidence in the literature that the accumulation in uh, 
the, the tumors um, is above that of nanoparticles of the same size that would be uh, accumulating through passive diffusion. So there seems to be some mechanism of active uh, migration into this tumor hypoxic environment. Um, it has been shown through extensive an extensive genetic characteristic characterization assay, excuse me, um, that there is metabolic activity in these spores, and um, that they have mRNA present in the spore form, that the species of mRNA that are present alter depending on, on the context that that spore is in. Um, and there's also alternative rRNA species that are found in the spores um, versus vegetative. So um, we'll put a question mark besides the spore, spore form where I recognize that the, those activities technically uh, make it not a spore form, um, but it, there are other bacteria that can do this, um, specifically segmented uh, filamentous bacteria tend to also have this type of a life cycle. Um, and there's a lot of characterization work that can be done in this area yet. Um, so Clostridium novi oncolysis, how does this bacteria actually um, accomplish tumor mitigation? Um, and this NT stands for non-toxic. This is one of those advances in genetic manipulation that has really brought this to the forefront in terms of oncolytic bacterial species. Um, where the main protein responsible, um, toxin responsible for sepsis is the alpha toxin, um, but it's encoded in a phage DNA plasmid that is not part of the genome, um, so we can remove that relatively easily. And with the removal of that um, phage DNA plasmid, um, there no longer is the septic capacity that we see of the, the um, uh, wild type Clostridium novi um, in the clinic. So at the center of the tumor, Clostridium novi has two characterized mechanisms to this point um, where it can uh, conduct direct oncolysis or direct lysis of these tumor cells. And this is through sort of the typical exotoxin secretion that is characteristic of the Clostridium family. Um, but there's also this non-canonical phospholipase activity that's been reported in the literature where there's at least one, if not two, um, and there's genomic sequences for more lipases that do have membrane disruption capacity um, that both of these mechanisms ultimately result in the increase of uh, damage associated molecular pathogens. Um, as well as, of course, the PAMs, the pathogen-associated molecular pathogens, the increase of that, those two molecules at the periphery of the tumor, at the oxygenated margins, causes a really strong recruitment of neutrophils, where neutrophils essentially form sort of a, a, a cage. They encircle the tumor um, at the oxygenated margins, meeting either the vegetative bacteria as they die through exposure to oxygenation or undergo sporulation, um, where the spores are also um, phagocytized um, and uh, cleared through um, urination in a fecal um, waste. Um, but these neutrophils, through mechanisms that have not yet been fully characterized through sort of the cytokines that are, are typically known to be uh, associated, and these are the cytokines that are elevated specifically in these infections, they create an inflammation reaction that ultimately results in T-cell-mediated immunity. So not only do we have this really potent direct from the center of a tumor to those oxygenated margins, um, ability to lyse tumors. Um, we also have this uh, immune retraining or essentially a, a sort of vaccination reaction that um, in the literature has conferred a lifelong renewed tumor surveillance capacity um, in animals where they reject a secondary challenge with um, similar tumors if they've been cured um, by Clostridium novi NT treatment. Um, so the, in particular, this species is has undergone um, phase 1b clinical trials as an intratumoral injection. Um, there's a couple of different studies that have come out uh, or have been initiated, um, and only one of these has released um, its uh, conclusions. Um, this was a intratumoral injection of sarcomas. There's also a combinatorial treatment uh, clinical trial, as well as several veterinarian trials ongoing um, with canines that develop spontaneous tumors. Um, so I want to go into this a little bit more deeply to, to really elucidate the safety and feasibility of using Clostridium novi NT um, as a cancer therapeutic um, and for oncolytic bacteria in general. This study, again, used non-thoracic sarcoma tumors, which in 
intrinsically have a higher percent oxygenation than pancreatic tumors that we'll talk about later. Um, but regardless, 42% of patients on the study had tumor destruction and pretty significant tumor destruction, ranging from 2 to 24%. And that's what you see up here is this is a CT scan of one of the patients at day zero. And then nine days post-treatment, they had regression of that tumor. In terms of adverse reactions, only 13% of the patients had um, adverse reactions. They were manageable, but significant. Um, and here's, again, one of the strengths of oncolytic bacteria is that these patients recovered with the administration of antibiotics, hydration, and vasopressors. Um, in terms of supportive care for uh, cancer therapeutics, this is relatively minimal. Um, this is a saline drip. If the toxicity gets too high, we can reduce that toxicity quite easily um, through a simple antibiotic administration. Um, and we're able to manage these very well um, in comparison to some of the other uh, side effects that we have. Um, but most importantly, what the study states um, and, and declares to the field is that it's supportive of additional studies in, in humans. Um, so there's their, their legs, there's a pathway forward through um, into human trials. So returning back to pancreatic cancer, um, intratumoral injection is great. Um, it's an amazing option for several cancers that are out there and should be pursued. Um, however, in terms of this specific cancer, 80% of cancer uh, pancreatic cancer is discovered in advanced stages. And this is largely after metastasis has occurred, somewhere above 65% of cancers when they are uh, pancreatic cancer upon detection are already metastatic and already have multiple locations in the same patient. Um, even within those statistics, uh, surgical resection is only really an option in about 20% of these patients due to um, complications with the location and the type of tissue. Um, and this really leads to um, questioning the feasibility of intratumoral injections for this particular cancer um, moving forward. Um, there have been a couple of studies um, prior to my work on intravenous injections of Clostridium novi and T spores. Um, this is a gamma scintography assay um, with Balb C mice um, and a subcutaneous flank tumor um, from colorectal tumor cells. And what I want to point out here um, is a couple of things. There's a lot of data here, but for the sake of time today, what I want to point out um, is that spores were cleared after 14 days. They do not colonize the, the gut. Um, they are not ever, they've never been characterized as part of a human microbiome, um, large, probably because of their, their really strict hypoxic uh, requirements. Um, but what happens is that the majority of spores are cleared within one hour through phagocytotic clearance through the liver, spleen, and kidney. Um, and only 1% from this injected dose really reached the tumor, which is relatively small. 99% of those um, spores were cleared um, without accomplishing tumor localization and, and staying in the spore state. However, even the 1% of this total dose accomplished tumor localization, 95% of subjects had tumor necrosis, and 30% of that 95% were considered cured. And I want to go back to some of the statistics that I presented at the beginning. Um, and we talked about fulfirinox, this combinatorial treatment that you see here, and how it was it's thought to be responsible for the recent 1.5% change in pancreatic cancer survival. Um, in early phase trials, um, fulfirinox had a 0.6% cure rate, um, and still it was able to have the most significant impact on pancreatic cancer therapeutics that we've seen in 50 years. Um, however, it's notable that this treatment comes with severe long-term side effects that are often lifelong um, in these patients. Um, and at, at, uh, at the Buffett Cancer Center, we work alongside our clinicians and we see our patients and we do um, some interactive work with patients. Our patients are not only looking for more options um, in terms of treatment, but also options for um, better quality of life while they are on that treatment. Um, so from that same study, if we look at um, intravenously introduced Clostridium novi um, and other sort of neoplastic or hypoxic regions in this model, we look at sort of uh, acute, um, acute models of ischemia and hypoxia compared to chronic models of uh, a reduction in oxygen availability. Um, what we don't see after intravenous administration of the spores is the presence of a vegetative form. You might get a spore in these tissues, um, 
because it's in the circulation, it's in the vasculature, it's in the, the macrophages, it's in the, or debris, especially if you're doing detection through DNA methods. Um, but you don't see uh, um, transition into that active, lytically capable um, vegetative form in any other physiological context than the center of the tumor. Um, so given the culmination of these characteristics, the fact that 99% of the intravenous dose did not reach the tumor, but we still had, had significant um, anti-cancer activity, what would happen um, if we increased tumor localization, the capacity or the efficiency or some uh, combination of both um, through applying surface modification, um, borrowing from the fields largely of nanoparticle um, modification, but also in uh, similar parallel fields of oncolytic viruses and other oncolytic bacterial species. Um, so this has been done um, in uh, the other oncolytic bacterial species, Salmonella, um, which has its own drawbacks um, as an oncolytic bacterial species. But the RGD peptide is an argly asp. So it's just those three amino acids. It's very small, it's uncharged. Um, it's very simple. It binds the alpha-5, beta-3 integrin that is commonly upregulated on tumor cells and their epithelial. Um, but most importantly for, for my research moving forward um, is that there's a robust literature of reference in terms of methodologies and, and uh, ways to work with this small peptide. Um, so it represents a relatively simple opportunity to probe the feasibility for spore surface modification. Um, and paired with the fact that the entire genome as well of both the spore form and the vegetative form, as well as a putative proteome has been published for Clostridium novi NT. Um, this provided a really potent opportunity to apply my background in genetic engineering um, and uh, to, to test some of these principles in, in CRISPR-Cas-based genetic engineering um, to see if we could conduct that in um, a bacterial context, um, nonetheless an oncolytic bacterial context. So we took that data um, and we really deeply analyzed that data that had been published. Um, and we came across, we, we decided on some criteria that you can see here that would make them, uh, these genes good targets to essentially hijack their, um, their in insertion and, and um, uh, representation on the spore surface. Um, Clostridium novi spores are known to form via crystallization, um, so it's not an active mechanism. And if we could get um, an RGD motif or residue um, into one of these proteins or, or present it on the surface at the right time, um, our theory was that it would be available um, to alter biodistribution. Um, so we found four gene insertion targets through this analysis um, and designed corresponding um, small guide RNA and homologous recombination arms um, manually because there were no algorithms. This is a non-canonical um, species. Um, it's, so we, we did this all by hand for each target gene. Um, I don't think I need to go into the CRISPR construct plan other, too deeply for this audience, other than to remind um, that there are several components that are necessary in order to accomplish um, genomic modification. Um, one of the first things that we did was we used a NICase instead of a double-stranded NIC, um, because bacterial species, uh, and in particular Clostridium, are very sensitive to double-stranded DNA breaks, um, and most of the kind, most of the time, this will initiate cell death pathways. Um, so we modified um, that way. Um, we prepared homologous recombination domains that contained our gene insert. In this case, it's the RGD insert here in the middle. Um, but then we also had uh, flexible linker regions that are GGA, providing some sort of um, physical um, ability to rotate around those bonds for availability. Um, and then also it's important to note um, when you're doing um, sort of these non-model species work that you do have to put in species-specific promoters and you do have to alter the codon biasing of all of these elements um, and all of the elements that are necessary for um, genomic insertion. Um, and then what I really want to emphasize is that the, these genes are very GC rich. They're somewhere around 60 to 70 percent. Um, so we knew that heading in, it was going to be complicated to, to um, elucidate uh, whether we had accomplished genomic engineering or not. So we planned for that by including um, validation restriction digests for each part 
um, of both the building of these plasmids as well as the genomic modification of um, Clostridium novi itself. Um, so we, we built this plasmid um, named PKMD002, um, and we accomplished transformation of Clostridium novi through um, uh, application of an enzyme called oxyrase that creates a hypoxic microenvironment. Um, and through using that um, enzyme, we were able to adapt the common E. coli calcium competency scheme to make Clostridium novi calcium competent and easier to transform. So that was one of the first big hurdles was transformation rates were very, very low. Um, and then through a temporary growth and selective marker containing media, um, we selected for cells that had taken up this uh, PKMD002. Um, from those cells, we then isolated both genomic DNA as well as um, looked for plasmid DNA, uh, which was not present in these cells. Um, they drop plasmids relatively quickly. Um, and within that genomic DNA, we conducted PCR with primers targeted to our site of insertion, so within this homologous recombination domain. Um, and then we digested uh, using this verification restriction digest site um, to tell us which of our candidates ha had accomplished genomic modification. Um, and as you can see, we had five or more candidates um, demonstrating genomic modification at the target loci um, after this process. Um, so now that we had genetic modification, it doesn't necessarily mean that this gene is being expressed. Um, so our next steps were to really look at the expression and functionality of this motif. Um, and that's what you see here is a TEM images of these spores themselves. So this is the unmodified Clostridium novi, the wild type. Um, this has been published in the literature. Um, the architecture of the cell is uh, somewhat complex, um, but there are landmarks um, that you can see in RTEMs that are comparable to what's in the literature. Um, what I'm going to point out here is this granular layer um, is the layer, the, the protein that we targeted um, to take advantage of its surface expression. We, we know that it's targeted to that layer um, in these spores. And what we found um, after um, the genetic modification was that this layer does appear. Here you have a somewhat solid um, line for this granular uh, layer indicating the honeycomb layer. Um, but in our RGD modified spores, that layer seems to have changed. Um, and if you look at our publication, we recognize that TEM um, is very subjective and difficult. Uh, you know, it depends on the angle, it depends on the fixation, all of that. We published all of our um, TEM images as supplementary data in this publication here at the bottom. But beyond that, um, it looks like we have physical indication of an alteration in, in due to genetic manipulation. Um, we also created a um, alpha-5, beta-3 integrin coded surface through the help of um, our polymer, polymer science um, department at NDSU, um, and we were able to test the adhesion of the RGD modified spores to this alpha-5, beta-3 integrin coated surface and found that candidate A from the previous slide had a significant increase in the number of spores that remained adhered to that surface versus the non-modified forms, but also versus the other candidates um, as well. So once the strain of RGD modified uh, Clostridium novi was created and we had some validation that it worked, uh, we proceeded forward with a pilot experiment in mice. So we used um, a syngenic immunocompetent C57 BL6 model um, to do orthotopic injections of a KPC cell um, from the Hollingsworth lab here at UNMC. Um, by injecting these cells, they have a very well-characterized uh, kinetics for tumor growth. In about 14 days, we had tumors established that were within inhumane endpoints. Um, so at that point, we injected a relatively low dose compared to the literature. We're about 500 to 5,000 times lower than what's been published in the literature before. Um, but we conducted this injection uh, via tail vein to simulate intravenous um, introduction um, in the carrier buffer of PBS. Uh, we supported our animals with subcutaneous fluid every four hours, um, as well as checking temperatures and monitoring behavior to, to monitor for adverse side effects. Um, but throughout that 24 hours was uh, allowed spores to, to biodistribute and tumor lice. Um, 24 hours is the time it takes for them to um, 
germinate to the vegetative form and then conduct um, proliferation. So we stopped it at 24 hours um, in order to really look closely at biodistribution um, and to look at where are modified spores going throughout all of the major organs. So at the point of necropsy, we harvested all of the major organs um, and we cut each of these in half. Half of the sample went to be homogenized in order to do differential PCR through 16S rRNA targeted primers. Um, as well as to undergo histological um, slide mount staining and analysis by our pathology collaborators. Um, you can see the cohorts here. Um, we have the overall cohorts of the background of a sham PBS tumor implantation or a KPC tumor implantation, and then the three different, um, this says wild type, but it is not, it is still non-toxic, it's just not modified. Um, and you can see that we are sex differentiated as well to the extent that we could um, with our colony. Um, and so what we found was um, the initial initial data from this indicates that the pancreata and the associated tumor tissue, uh, when treated with CNNT, we see a pretty uh, stark increase in mass. So the percent mass that the pancreas represents to each individual mouse. Um, this is due to fluid uptake and likely neutrophil invasion. Um, and this is in line with the literature and is often the first sign of clostridium novi. Um, penetration and localization to the tumor. So this was promising. From there, we did the uh, differential PCR with 16S rRNA primers. What we found was that we did see an alteration in biodistribution throughout. So what you see up here is just a yes or no answer. Did we see amplification of Clostridium novi in T16S rRNA DNA um, or not? Um, and what we found was overall, both the RGD modified cohorts um, were elevated in terms of spores were sticking around um, longer um, in um, all, both the treated cohorts. Um, so this is very interesting um, and provides a lot of data moving forward. Um, RGD modification from this data does seem to alter the biodistribution pattern um, and it does increase in uh, increased localization to the pancreas. And while immediately a lot of folks uh, see this data and they throw up red flags, um, rightfully so, about the fact that we are no longer, um, we seem to have potentially lost tumor specificity that this increase um, and bio burden in these animals does not seem to depend on the tumor, um, but also that we're getting localization into the lung, the heart, and the brain. But I want to just very strongly remind folks that we are confined to the methods uh, we're detecting DNA. This does not mean infection. It does not mean that they are active. Um, it doesn't even mean that they are in spore form anymore. They might be debris that is in the process of being phagocytosed and cleared. Um, they may have germinated to the vegetative phase. This data does not give us information regarding that. Um, those are the immediate future directions of this study. Um, but they also could have remained as spores in the vasculature. The lungs um, and the brain would be the first lines of lymphatic associated tissue clearance. Um, so while this, this um, may come off as a, a safety concern moving forward, um, it's also a mechanism of RGD is known to generally increase tumor uh, the the time in circulation spent by nanoparticles. Um, so this is it was an expected result um, and also um, is a in strong support that the RGD molecule is working um, as it did in um, nanoparticle literature. So furthermore, if we zoom in sort of on those um, go, move past those the we'll call them yellow or orange flags of this data. Um, RGD modification resulted in twice the total bio burden. So if we look at how many how many nanograms per amplicon are present um, throughout the animal when treated with RGD modified spores, there's twice the burden um, than from non-modified spores. Um, and that we see from um, looking at the pancreas and the associated pancreatic tumor, there is a 30% increase in relative tumor localizations specific to the pancreas and tumor um, as compared to non-modified spores. Um, and this is again, um, compared to the previous literature um, that indicates only 1% um, of previous intravenous dosages um, accomplished tumor localization. Um, so from there, we looked at the histopathology um, with our pathology partners. Um, a clinical pathologist who was blinded to sample treatment reviewed all of our slides while blinded to treatment. Um, he then came back after he was unblinded, but while he was blinded, um, he analyzed that three out of three of the, so all of the modified um, 
tumors that he saw and two out of the three tumors for the non-modified CNNT had inflammation that was above the background of the sham treatment. Um, so it was above what had been caused by the orthotopic tumor um, surgery itself, um, indicative of that we do have a bacterial mediated um, tumor infection. Um, which is a positive for this study. Um, he also observed evidence of larger necrotic cores. So these are what he selected as um, representative samples for each of the cohorts. Um, and done, we did whole slide scanning um, and all of that data is posted in a repository as well alongside this um, publication. Um, so this is the, the uh, PBS treated or the, the buffer treated tumor and then the non-modified treated tumor and the RGD modified tumor. And what you can see is that the necrotic core gets larger um, with CNOVI treatment in general, but specifically um, the necrotic cores of RGD modified CNNT treatment um, is about twice the size um, of the non-modified. Um, furthermore, uh, evidence of larger or evidence of um, spore-like particles um, co-localized with granulocytic invasion. Um, so the orange arrows here indicate um, something that morphologically corresponds with the right size and shape as a clostridium novi spore would be. And then the white arrows um, pathologically correspond with a granulocytic um, uh, cell, um, presumably moving to respond to the spores. Um, and these were found in a higher, to a higher degree, they were scored to a higher degree of inflammation for the RGD modified treated mice. Um, now that doesn't tell us as much because it's morphological, it's not necessarily a spore um, uh, or sp our spores. Um, pancreatic tumors are now known to have their own microbiome that is populated by spore species. Um, so we went back to these slides and we con conducted laser capture micro dissection um, where we lasered out the centers of the of these slides and then conducted differential PCR amplification um, and found that the only slide that had Clostridium novi DNA presence was the RGD modified treated sample. Um, so while homogenized samples indicate that there is Clostridium novi DNA present in this tumor um, in general, um, the RGD modified treated cohort was in the center of this tumor and had accomplished localization. Um, and presumably if we had let this study go further would have accomplished tumor colonization. Um, so this was very promising. Um, together, this preliminary data suggests that spores expressing RGD on the spore surface uh, may more efficiently localize to pancreatic tumors, to orthotopic pancreatic tumors, so in the pancreas, um, than non-modified synovi in T. Um, and we also, this paper begins to sort of look at the immune, uh, to characterize the immune response because we do get a very potent um, stimulation. Um, of the immune microenvironment. So we looked at, this is the same, that RGD modified um, tumor sample that the pathologist selected as representative. And we conducted a cyclic multiplex immunofluorescence um, where this is the slide right before the tumor. So your tumor is um, like just a couple of micrometers, um, microns past um, this interface. So we're right at the interface between the pancre pancreas and the tumor. Um, in the RGD treated um, sample. Um, and we used DAPI as a nuclear stain. MUC1 or mucin one is a particular focus of the Hollingsworth lab here at UNMC. Um, so mucin one is a, a really canonical indicator um, of pancreatic cancer uh, tumor cells. Um, so that's the green that you see is that we're, we're right in front of um, the tumors on, if we were to take a, a, a sequential slide, it would be on the next slide. Um, and then we also stain for um, MPO or, um, um, I'm forgetting what that stands for right now, but it's a canonical marker for neutrophils as well as F480, um, which is a canonical marker for macrophages. Um, and when we look at the co-localization, they are strongly co-localized at the margins of the tumors, um, meaning that cyclic multiplex corroborates neutrophil recruitment to tumor margins, um, which is known in the literature to be indicative of the first stages of Clostridium novi NT colonization. So what this really uh, means in terms of our study um, and begins to elucidate is that the immune stimulation capacity, that indirect oncolytic capacity of RGD modified CNNT remains intact and is not um, destroyed through our genetic modification that um, confers surface modifications. 
So with that in conclusion, um, hopefully what I have um, convinced you today or started you to think about at least is that spore surface modification via genetic engineering is a viable avenue to modify oncolytic capacities for Clostridium novi, um, as well as other oncolytic bacterial species as well. Um, and through our efforts on this work, we're really hoping um, and we really see the future directions of this research to be that an intravenously administered C. novi NT therapy could target a broad range of solid tumors, not just pancreatic tumors, um, but we are starting with pancreatic tumors. Um, and this could happen regardless of tumor sage, cell composition, whether it's stem cells or stromal or ECM rich um, or even highly necrotic. Um, it wouldn't matter if it's a reoccurring tumor, if it's the primary first time that this patient has been diagnosed. Um, therapeutic resistance shouldn't matter. Um, and in theory, metastases could also be treated through a single intravenous dosage. Um, and then we could also work in coordination with current therapeutics um, or use it as a um, exquisitely selective um, delivery vehicle. Um, and in combination to these direct effects, um, we can also um, in combination retrain the immune system to identify tumorigenic cells, which effectively vaccinates against new tumor development um, and provides um, lifelong help um, and lifelong um, potential for mitigating further tumors in a way that isn't really seen with current therapeutics. So with that, um, science is never done in a vacuum. I have a wonderful team of folks. My postdoc was done in two labs, both the Hollingsworth and Bales lab. Um, and the, the data I presented today is from my postdoc, but it also spans multiple institutions. Um, so folks that directly contributed, the data I presented um, is mine. I did most of this data, but I was not alone in doing this. So the folks that helped are in bold. Um, and then some of the data is from my previous institution um, that you can see here, and those folks are also in bold. Um, so with that, I really thank you for your time, um, and I'm happy to take any questions or comments. Fantastic. So that's amazing work. Uh, I'm, thank you. I'm seeing the promise uh, we potentially cure completely the cancer in the future. Uh, yeah. Let me, let me start. Yeah. yeah. Let me start with one question. Uh, you may or may not think about potential issue using genetic modification. Um, you're talking about the surface modification, but small peptide you already inserted, but that right. is still, we call it GMO. Right. Uh, yes. Yep. What would be your, you know, way to address GMO issue after this only released into the environment. Yeah, yeah. So biocontainment, long-term biocontainment. Yeah. Uh, so eventually we're hoping to use similar mechanisms that you have used yourself in your research with the temperature sensitive mm -hmm. um, CAS um, modifications where when these spores are secreted through the urine or feces in, in so to speak, a patient environment, again, this is, this is years down the road, but eventually, um, in addition to the sort of natural capacity where they cannot survive in any level of oxygenation, they'll stay in the spore form. Hmm. Um, we can introduce a Cas9 um, enzyme that is expressed at room temperatures or temperatures outside the body um, that will chew through the, the genome and cause cell death as well. I see. That's interesting. Uh, let me ask one probably very challenging question uh and then we probably end if we don't have any question from audience uh you know we we spend a lot of money for many decades to conquer cancers but still we we see some achievement i believe we have some you know advances in cancer treatment but still you know we are not completely overcome the cancer problem and now I kind of start to realize that is not necessarily because we don't have any solution, but that is probably because we living longer and we didn't know about cancer before, but we got to know more about cancer because we have the more diagnosis technology. And then to me, I mean, this is a part of the aging. Cancer is part of the aging in some sense. And then we try to still overcome because to you know, make our life longer. 
why right. why why cancer is so difficult to conquer? I mean, it's one <laughs> sentence. Why why that's so difficult? I'm just curious. Yeah, it's a very complex disease, and it really is. We talk about it as if it's one disease, but it's a multitude of diseases, where almost every tumor presents differently, even in a, in the same patient, even if it's a metastasis. Um, a lot of the work that the Hollingsworth Lab has done with our rapid autopsy program. Um, is to characterize these tumors from our human donors. Um, and um, there's still, we've got a lot of work to do. Um, and it's it's a very complex problem and complex problems require complex solutions. Um, so hopefully we're onto something um, and hopefully we can, um, I, my argument is that all options should be on the table. We should have chemotherapeutics, radiotherapeutics, you know, all of these options should be considered under development for um, novel therapeutics. So, but you're right, I mean, there's a translation issue. There's a translation hurdle where um, pancreatic cancer is one of the least translatable basic research areas, according to mm -hmm. NIH statistics. So um, in terms of my research, that's something that we are uniquely, maybe not uniquely, but we are specifically aware of um, in everything that we do. Um, there's a really big effort in my papers to be very clear with the methods that I use um, and to be very um, clear about scalability, about reproducibility, you know, looking at not just this paper, but looking at this field um, and trying to learn from the lessons of, you know, Coley's toxin and um, the success of BCG. Uh, Bacillus calmat guarin has been the standard of care for 80 years for bladder cancer. Um, that's an oncolytic bacterial therapy. Um, so there's good lessons and bad lessons from what's been done. Um, and we're, I am, I am very aware of those. <laughs> sure, sure. I, I hope you and other people, you know, in near future, you know, conquer, you know, this cancer problem. Because I mean, you know, my wife also got benign tumor twice and the surgery twice, but she's fine now, but still, you know, that is not, you know, good. <laughs> you know, experience for me, yeah. I mean, for her as well. So I hope. Yeah. Uh, okay, so now I believe we need to close. Uh, uh, let me double check whether we have any question. Uh, let's, let's see. Okay. All right. So thank you for joining us and staying today. There will be no seminar next week, of course, uh, due to the U.S. Thanksgiving holiday. So happy Thanksgiving to all. We'll meet again on November 30th, Thursday, the same time, the same Zoom link. We'll have Dr. John Erickson at USDA and the Professor Eduardo, Eduardo Gonzalez Grandio at Spanish National Center for Biotechnology. As usual, the follow informal chat will occur without recording. Please stay here if you are interested in chatting with us. I will promote you to panelists who can speak and show your handsome and pretty faces if you wish. And thanks, I stop recording. Just one second.